सी आई ई टी एन सी ई आर टी प्रेजेंट ऑडियो बुक ऑफ हिस्ट्री फॉर क्लास सेवेंथ इन टाइटल्ड आर पास टू दिस इज द चैप्टर थ्री टाइटल द डेली सुल्तान फ्रॉम पेज नंबर थर्टी टू पेज नंबर फोर्टी फोर लेट्स लिसन टू द चैप्टर थ्री द डेली सुल्तान पेज थर्टी the delhi sultans in chapter 2 we saw that regions like kaveri delta became the center of large kingdoms did you notice that there was no mention of a kingdom with delhi as its capital that was because delhi became an important city only in the 12th century look at the table 1 Delhi first became the capital of a kingdom under the Tomar Rajputs who were defeated in the middle of the 12th century by Chauhans also referred to as Chahamanas of Ajmer It was under the Tomars and Chauhans that Delhi became an important commercial center Many rich Jain merchants lived in the city and constructed several temples coins minted here and called delhi wal had a wide circulation the transformation of delhi into a capital that controlled vast areas of the subcontinent started with the foundation of the delhi sultanate in the beginning of the 13th century take a look at table 1 again and identify the five dynasties that together made the delhi sultanate On the left-hand bottom of this page a map is shown map 1 selected sultanate cities of delhi 13th to 14th centuries this map shows river yamuna and other important places of delhi firozabad firoz shah kotla khos khas siri jahanpana delhi kuwa कुतुब मीनार हौज सुल्तान तुगलकाबाद आदिलाबाद पेज थर्टी वन द रूलर्स ऑफ डेली टेबल वन राजपूत डायनेस्टीज तोमर्स अर्ली ट्वेल्थ सेंचुरी टिल इलेवन सिक्सटी फाइव अनंगपाल इलेवन थर्टी टू इलेवन फोर्टी फाइव Chauhans 1165 to 1192 Prithviraj Chauhan 1175 to 1192 Early Turkish rulers 1206 to 1290 Kutubuddin Aybak 1206 to 1210 Shamsuddin Iltutmish 1210 to 1236 Razia 1236 to 1240 Ghiasuddin Balban 1266 to 1287 On the right hand top of this page a picture is shown This is Iltutmish's tomb Khalji dynasty 1290 to 1320 Jalaluddin Khalji 1290 to 1296 alauddin khalji 1296 to 1316 tughlaq dynasty 1320 to 1414 giyasuddin tughlaq 1320 to 1324 muhammad tughlaq 1324 to 1351 firoz shah tughlaq 1351 to 1388 on the left hand side of this page a picture is shown this is alai darwaza sayyid dynasty 1414 to 1451 khijr khan 1414 to 1421 lodi dynasty 1451 to 1526 Behlol Lodi 1451 to 
to 1489. On the right-hand bottom of this page, a picture is shown. This is Firoz Shah Tughlaq's tomb. Page number 32. Finding out about the Delhi Sultans. Although inscriptions, coins and architecture provide a lot of information, especially valuable are histories or tarikh. Singular, tawarikh, plural, written in Persian. The language of administration under the Delhi Sultans. On this page, four pictures are shown. Figure 1. Four stages in the making of a manuscript. A. Preparing the paper. B. Writing the text. C. Melting gold to highlight important words and passages. D. Preparing the binding. The authors of Tawarikh were learned men, secretaries, administrators, poets and courtiers who both recounted events and advised rulers on governance, emphasizing the importance of just rule. The Circle of Justice Fakhre Mudabbir wrote in 13th century, A king cannot survive without soldiers, and soldiers cannot live without salaries. Salaries come from the revenue collected from peasants, but peasants can pay revenue only when they are prosperous and happy. This happens when the king promotes justice and honest governance. On the left-hand bottom, a question is being asked, written, in a blue box. Do you think the circle of justice is an appropriate term to describe the relationship between the king and his subjects? Page 33 Keep the following additional details in mind. 1. The authors of Tawarikh lived in cities, mainly Delhi, and hardly ever in villages. 2. They often wrote their histories for sultans in the hope of rich rewards. 3. These authors advised rulers on the need to preserve an ideal social order based on birthright and gender distinctions. Their ideas were not shared by everybody. In 1236, Sultan Iltutmish's daughter, Razia, became Sultan. The chronicler of the age, Minhaj Siraj, recognized that she was more able and qualified than all her brothers. But he was not comfortable at having a queen as ruler. Nor were the nobles happy at her attempts to rule independently. She was removed from the throne in 1240. What Minhaj Siraj thought about Razia? Minhaj Siraj thought that the queen's rule went against the ideal social order created by God in which women were supposed to be subordinate to men. He therefore asked, In the register of God's creation, since her account did not fall under the column of men, how did she gain from all her excellent qualities? On her inscriptions and coins, Razia mentioned that she was the daughter of Sultan Iltutmish. This was in contrast to the Queen Rudrama Devi, 1216-1289 of the Kakatiya dynasty of Warangal, part of modern Andhra Pradesh. Rudrama Devi changed her name on her inscriptions and pretended she was a man. Another queen, Didda, ruled in Kashmir, 980 to 1003. Her title is interesting. It comes from Didi or elder sister, an obvious affectionate term given to a loved ruler by her subjects. Express Minhaj's idea in your own words. Do you think Razia shared these ideas? Why do you think it was so difficult for a woman to be a ruler? On the right-hand side of this page, 
some important terms have been explained. Birthright Privileges claimed on account of birth. For example, people believed that nobles inherited their rights to govern because they were born in certain families. Gender distinctions Social and biological differences between women and men. Usually, these differences are used to argue that men are superior to women. Page 34 From Garrison Town to Empire The Expansion of the Delhi Sultanate Map 2 Major Cities Captured by Shamsuddin il -Tutmish. In this map, the names of these major cities are Kajakot Multan, Lahore, Uch, Tabar Hind, Kuhram, Sunam, Barwala, Hansi, Sursuti, Delhi, Kasil, Mandor, Baran, Badayun, Sam Bhanak, Ajmer, Gwalior, Ranthambor, Avad, Banaras, Laknauti. In the early 13th century, the control of the Delhi Sultans rarely went beyond heavily fortified towns occupied by garrisons. The sultans seldom controlled the hinterland of the cities and were therefore dependent upon trade, tribute or plunder for supplies. Controlling garrison towns in distant Bengal and Sindh from Delhi was extremely difficult. Rebellion, war, even bad weather could snap fragile communication routes. Delhi's authority was also challenged by Mongol invasions from Afghanistan and by governors who rebelled at any sign of the Sultan's weakness. The Sultanate barely survived these challenges. Its consolidation occurred during the reign of Gayasuddin Balban and further expansion under Alauddin Khalji and Muhammad Tughlaq. The first set of campaigns along the internal frontier of the Sultanate aimed at consolidating the hinterlands of the garrison towns. During these campaigns, forests were cleared in the Ganga Yamuna Doab and hunter-gatherers and pastoralists expelled from their habitat. Page 35 These lands were given to peasants and agriculture was encouraged. New fortresses Garrison towns and towns were established to protect trade routes and to promote regional trade. The second expansion occurred along the external frontier of the Sultanate. Military expeditions into southern India started during the reign of Alauddin Khalji. See map 3 and culminated with Muhammad Tughlaq. In their campaigns, Sultanate armies captured elephants, horses and slaves and carried away precious metals. By the end of Muhammad Tughlaq's reign, 150 years after somewhat humble beginnings, the armies of the Delhi Sultanate had marched across a large part of the subcontinent. They had defeated rival armies and seized cities. The Sultanate collected taxes from the peasantry and dispensed justice in its realm. But how complete and effective was its control over such a vast territory? Map 3 Alauddin Khalji's Campaign into South India In 1299, from Delhi to Gujarat. In 1303, from Delhi to Chittor. In 1301, Delhi to Ranthambhor. In 1305, Delhi to Mandu and Devgiri. And between 1310 and 1311, Devgiri to Dwar Samudra or Hoyasal. From Hoyasal 
और द्वार समुद्र इन 1311 टू मदुरई एंड तंजावूर फ्रॉम देवगिरी टू वारंगल इन 1311 बिटवीन 1302 टू 1303 फ्रॉम दिल्ली टू वारंगल इन 1296 फ्रॉम कड़ा टू देवगिरी इन 1311 From Devagiri to Varangal. Page thirty-six. On the right-hand top of this page, a picture is shown. Figure two. Figure two. Kuwait Al Islam Mosque and Minaret, built during the last decade of the twelfth century. This was the congregational mosque of the first city built by the Delhi sultans described in the chronicles as Delhi e Kuhna the old city The mosque was enlarged by Iltutmish and Alauddin Khalji The minar was built by two sultans Qutbuddin Aibak and Iltutmish The masjid A mosque is called a masjid in Arabic literally a place where a muslim prostrates in reverence to Allah In a congregational mosque Masjid Jami or Jama Masjid Muslims read their prayers namaz together Members of the congregation choose the most respected learned male as their leader imam for the rituals of prayer he also delivers the sermon khutbah during the friday prayer during the prayer muslims stand facing makkah in india this is to the west this is called the qibla on the bottom of this page a picture is shown figure 3 begampuri mosque built in the reign of muhammad tughlaq was the main mosque of jahanpana the sanctuary of the world his new capital in delhi see map 1 page 37 on the top of this page a picture is shown figure 4 moot ki masjid built in the reign of sikandar lodi by his minister The Delhi sultans built several mosques in cities all over the subcontinent. These demonstrated their claims to be protectors of Islam and Muslims. Mosques also helped to create the sense of a community of believers who shared a belief system and a code of conduct. It was necessary to reinforce this idea of community because Muslims came from a variety of backgrounds. In the middle of this page a picture is shown figure 5 Mosque of Jamali Kamali built in the late 1520s In the middle of this page a question is being asked written in a blue box Compare figures 2 3 4 and 5 What similarities and differences do you notice amongst the mosques? The mosques in figures 3, 4 and 5 show an evolution in architectural tradition that culminates in Shah Jahan's mosque in Delhi. See figure 7 in chapter 5. A close look administration and consolidation under the Khaljis and Tughlaqs. The consolidation of a kingdom as vast as the Delhi Sultanate needed reliable governors and administrators rather than appointing aristocrats and landed chieftains as governors. The early Delhi sultans especially Iltutmish favored their special slaves purchased for military service called bandgah in Persian. They were carefully trained to man some of the most important political offices in the kingdom since they were totally dependent upon their master 
the Sultan could trust and rely upon them. Page 38 Slaves rather than sons The Sultans were advised, a slave whom one has brought up and promoted must be looked after for its needs a whole lifetime and good luck to find a worthy and experienced slave. Wise men have said that a worthy and experienced slave is better than a son. Can you think of any reason why a slave would be better than a son? The Khaljis and the Tughlaqs continued to use Bandaga and also raised people of humble birth who were often their clients to high political positions. They were appointed as generals and governors. However, this also introduced an element of political instability. Slaves and clients were loyal to their masters and patrons but not to their heirs. New sultans had their own servants. As a result, the accession of a new monarch often saw conflict between the old and the new nobility. The patronage of these humble people by the Delhi sultans also shocked many elites, and the authors of Persian Tawarikh criticized the Delhi sultans for appointing the low and baseborn to high offices. Officials of Sultan Muhammad Tughlaq Sultan Muhammad Tughlaq appointed Aziz Khumar, a wine distiller, Firoz Hajjam, a barber, Manka Tabak, a cook, and two gardeners, Laddha and Pira, to high administrative posts. Ziauddin Barni, a mid-14th century chronicler, reported their appointments as a sign of the Sultan's loss of political judgment and his incapacity to rule. Why do you think Burni criticized the Sultan? On the right-hand side of this page, an important term has been explained. Client Someone who is under the protection of another, a dependent or hanger-on. Page 39 Like the earlier sultans, the Khalji and Tughlaq monarchs appointed military commanders as governors of territories of varying sizes. These lands were called Ikta and their holder was called Iktadar or Mukti. The duty of the Muktis was to lead military campaigns and maintain law and order in their Iktas. In exchange for their military services, the Muktis collected the revenue of their assignments as salary. They also paid their soldiers from these revenues. Control over Muktis was most effective if their office was not inheritable and if they were assigned Iktas for a short period of time before being shifted. These harsh conditions of service were rigorously imposed during the reigns of Alauddin Khalji and Muhammad Tughlaq. Accountants were appointed by the state to check the amount of revenue collected from the muktis. Care was taken that the mukti collected only the taxes prescribed by the state and that he kept the required number of soldiers. As the Delhi sultans brought the hinterland of the cities under their control, they forced the landed chieftains, the Samant aristocrats and rich landlords to accept their authority. Under Alauddin Khalji, the state brought the assessment and collection of land revenue under its own control. The rights of the local chieftains to levy taxes were cancelled and they were also forced to pay taxes. The Sultan's administrators measured the land and kept careful accounts. Some of the old chieftains and landlords served the Sultanate as revenue collectors and assessors. There were three types of taxes, one on cultivation called kharaj and amounting to about 50% of the peasants' produce, two on cattle, 
and 3 on houses. It is important to remember that large parts of the subcontinent remained outside the control of the Delhi Sultanate. It was difficult to control distant provinces like Bengal from Delhi and soon after annexing southern India, the entire region became independent. Even in the Gangetic Plain, there were forested areas that Sultanate forces could not penetrate. Page 40 Local chieftains established their rule in these regions. Sometimes, rulers like Alauddin Khalji and Muhammad Tughlaq could force their control in these areas, but only for a short duration. Chieftains and their fortifications Ibn Battuta, a 14th century traveller from Morocco, Africa, explained that chieftains sometimes fortified themselves in mountains, in rocky, uneven and rugged places as well as in bamboo grooves. In India, the bamboo is not hollow, it is big. Its several parts are so intertwined that even fire cannot affect them. And they are on the whole very strong. The chieftains live in these forests which serve them as ramparts inside which are the cattle and their crops. There is also water for them within, that is, rain water which collects there. Hence, they cannot be subdued except by powerful armies who, entering these forests, cut down the bamboos with specially prepared instruments. Describe the ways in which the chieftains arranged for their defence. The Mongols under Genghis Khan or Changiz Khan Transoxiana in northeast Iran in 1219 and the Delhi Sultanate faced their onslaught soon after. Mongol attacks on the Delhi Sultanate increased during the reign of Alauddin Khalji and in the early years of Muhammad Tughlaq's rule. This forced the two rulers to mobilize a large standing army in Delhi which posed a huge administrative challenge. Let us see how the two sultans dealt with this. Page 41 Alauddin Khalji Delhi was attacked twice in 1299 or 1300 and 1302 to 1303. As a defensive measure, Alauddin Khalji raised a large standing army. Alauddin constructed a new garrison town named Siri for his soldiers. See map 1. The soldiers had to be fed. This was done through the produce collected as tax from lands between the Ganga and Yamuna. Tax was fixed at 50% of the peasants' yield. The soldiers had to be paid. Alauddin chose to pay his soldiers' salaries in cash rather than iktas. The soldiers would buy their supplies from merchants in Delhi and it was thus feared that merchants would raise their prices. To stop this, Alauddin controlled the prices of goods in Delhi. Prices were carefully surveyed by officers and merchants who did not sell at the prescribed rates, were punished. Alauddin's administrative measures were quite successful and chroniclers praised his reign for its cheap prices and efficient supplies of goods in the market. He successfully withstood the threat of Mongol invasions. Muhammad Tughlaq The Sultanate was attacked in the early years of Muhammad Tughlaq's reign. The Mongol army was defeated. Muhammad Tughlaq was confident about the strength of his army and his resources to plan an attack on Transoxiana. He therefore raised a large standing army. Rather than constructing a new garrison town, the oldest of the four cities of Delhi, dehli e kuhna was emptied of its residents and the soldiers garrisoned there. The residents of the old city were sent to the new capital of Dalatabad in the south. Produce from the same area was collected as tax to feed the army. 
but to meet the expense of maintaining such a large number of soldiers, the Sultan levied additional taxes. This coincided with the famine in the area. Muhammad Tughlaq also paid his soldiers cash salaries, but instead of controlling prices, he used a token currency, somewhat like present-day paper currency, but made out of cheap metals, not gold and silver. People in the 14th century did not trust these coins. They were very smart. They saved their gold and silver coins and paid all their taxes to the state with this token currency. This cheap currency could also be counterfeited easily. Muhammad Tughlaq's administrative measures were a failure. His campaign into Kashmir was a disaster. He then gave up his plans to invade Transoxiana and disbanded his large army. Meanwhile, his administrative measures created complications. The shifting of people to Dalatabad was resented. The raising of taxes and famine in the Ganga Yamuna belt led to widespread rebellion. And finally, the token currency had to be recalled. Page 42 In this list of Muhammad Tughlaq's failure, we sometimes forget that for the first time in the history of the Sultanate, a Delhi Sultan planned a campaign to capture Mongol territory. Unlike Alauddin's defensive measures, Muhammad Tughlaq's measures were conceived as a part of a military offensive against the Mongols. The Sultanate in the 15th and 16th centuries Take a look at Table 1 again. You will notice that after the Tughlaqs, the Sayyid and Lodi dynasties ruled from Delhi and Agra until 1526. By then, Jaunpur, Bengal, Malwa, Gujarat, Rajasthan and the entire South India had independent rulers who established flourishing states and prosperous capitals. This was also the period which saw the emergence of new ruling groups like the Afghans and the Rajputs. Some of the states established in this period were small but powerful and extremely well administered. Sher Shah Sur, who ruled between 1540 and 1545, started his career as the manager of a small territory for his uncle in Bihar and eventually challenged and defeated the Mughal emperor Humayun, who ruled between 1530 to 1540 and 1555 to 1556. Sher Shah captured Delhi and established his own dynasty. Although the Sur dynasty ruled for only 15 years, 1540 to 1555, it introduced an administration that borrowed elements from Alauddin Khalji and made them more efficient. Sher Shah's administration became the model followed by the great emperor Akbar, who ruled between 1556 to 1605 when he consolidated the Mughal Empire. Page 43 The Three Orders The Peace of God Knights and the Crusades The idea of the Three Orders was first formulated in France in the early 11th century. It divided society into three classes, those who prayed, those who fought, and those who tilled the land. This division of society into three orders was supported by the church to consolidate its dominant rule in society. This helped the emergence of a new warrior group called Knights. The church patronized this group and used them to propagate their idea of peace of God. The attempt was to direct warriors away from conflict amongst themselves and send them instead on a campaign against the Muslims who had captured the city of Jerusalem. This led to a series of campaigns called the Crusades. These campaigns in the service of God and the Church completely altered the status of knights. 
Originally, these knights did not belong to the class of nobles, but by the end of the 11th century in France and a century later in Germany, the humble origins of these warriors were forgotten. By the 12th century, nobles also wanted to be known as knights. Imagine, you are a peasant in Alauddin Khalji's or Muhammad Tughlaq's reign and you cannot pay the taxes demanded by the Sultan. What will you do? Let's recall. 1. Which ruler first established his or her capital at Delhi? 2. What was the language of administration under the Delhi Sultans? 3. In whose reign did the Sultanate reach its farthest extent? 4. From which country did Ibn Battuta travel to India? Page 44 Let's understand. 5. According to the circle of justice, why was it important for military commanders to keep the interests of the peasantry in mind? 6. What is meant by the internal and external frontiers of the Sultanate? 7. What were the steps taken to ensure that Muktis performed their duties? Why do you think they may have wanted to defy the orders of the Sultans? 8. What was the impact of the Mongol invasions on the Delhi Sultanate? Let's discuss. 9. Do you think the authors of Tawarikh would provide information about the lives of ordinary men and women? 10. Razia Sultan was unique in the history of the Delhi Sultanate. Do you think women leaders are accepted more readily today? 11. Why were the Delhi Sultans interested in cutting down forests? Does deforestation occur for the same reasons today? Let's do. 12. Find out whether there are any buildings built by the Delhi Sultans in your area. Are there any buildings in your area that were built between the 12th and 15th centuries? Describe some of these buildings and draw sketches of them. Key words. Ikta, Tarikh, Garrison, Mongols, Gender, Kharaj. The chapter 3 of total 10 chapters of the book ends here. Narrator, Babla Kochar. You were just listening to this audio book. Technical Control, Bati Langlingdo. Technical Assistance, Vikas Sangwan. Assistance in Production, Kusum Lata. Direction and Production Vimalesh Chaudhary This audiobook is brought to you by CIET and CERT New Delhi, India